Today, our guest on the Primal Foundations podcast is Jason Brown. Jason is commonly known on social media as Carnivore JT. He's an advocate of an animal-based and carnivore lifestyle, author of the Carnivorous Cookbook, founder of the Savage Carnivore Company, and the host of the Inner Carnivore Podcast. JT, welcome to the show. How's it going? I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, uh, I I love your page. You know, I you just kept popping up, so I'm like, I'm gonna follow this guy. And uh, your page is great. It's like super fun and informative all at the same time, which I appreciate that you can joke around a little bit. You know, there's those. Uh, I love what you do. You 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 capture everybody's attention with somebody saying something bad about like carnivore or whatever, and then you're like flashes, like you're like, oh no. Oh no, 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 no. And then you go another way and you make it funny. It's, it's good. I like it. Yeah. I, so I realized it wasn't my intention when I started. Um, and it took me, it actually took me quite a while to kind of find my groove, um, on social media. And for anybody who's like starting out and doesn't have a big following, it took me. So I was at, I hit the one year mark and I think I was, I had just hit 5,000 followers, like something like that. So this is Instagram. Um, Twitter had a little bit better success, but not a ton. And so and I was producing similar content. And I finally found like a little bit of a groove in kind of, I'll, I'll call it my niche of the the carnivore market. And then it exploded. Um, you know, and so people struggle with that, right? It's always okay to adapt and evolve and just keep doing it until you find something that works. Uh, you know, like I said, it took me a year to get 5,000 and then it took me six months, not even that five and a half months to get to, I'm almost at hundred K now. Yeah. And so it's, and what I realized was carnivore has, there's like two main types of carnivore people. There's the doctors, right? There's the, the doctors, the PhDs, the scientists, the, you know, nutritionists, the dietitians, the people that lend credibility because of their accreditations, right? Their education. And then you have the success stories. And a lot of the success stories are great, right? I love them. I follow a lot of them, but they're all very similar, right? They're positive. They're like, this is what I eat. This is what I do. And I'm like, man, we don't really have like people who aren't bound by a professional code, right? I can do whatever the heck I want. Like <laughs> who's going to come say, no, you can't do that, right? Like I can literally do whatever I want. I'm like, I can be, I can be a little snarky. I can be a little like in your face. I don't have to be the person that, and it surprises people because they'll go, what, why are you saying like, that's rude. I'm like, you talk crap to me and then expect me to just like, be like, oh man, I appreciate your comment. Like, <laughs> no, like, so I started off a little, a little harsh with the, uh, eat an effing steak slogan. And then I kind of, you know, found my way into it, but yeah, I've kind of found the little niche where it's. You know, you can still have some studies and you can still do layman's term stuff, but I don't have to necessarily be cute and polite about it. Yeah, everybody. And it's hard. You know, I've I, I'm, I'm still finding my groove. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm posting things that I like. I'm trying to have conversations with people that I feel that I'm interested in and that whatever following I do have would, would can benefit from. And that's the biggest thing. And kind of what you were saying. It's also, it depends because look at Sean Baker. Like he's an MD, he's all that. But Sean Baker's blowing up just because he's eating steak. And then on the side of his like page, it's just like this vegan propaganda or somebody doing something stupid or whatever. And he's just eating. I was like, and I'm like thinking, I'm like, man, that's a good one. Like that's his thing. And he's got, I mean, ever since he started doing that, just blown up, blown up, blown up. Same with uh, Carnivore Ray. I had Carnivore Ray on and it's just him talking about stuff, just stuff. Like he's like, do it, do it or don't. This is what I do. And like, he's blown up, you know, and it's great. It's great to just see the success sort stories. You got people in this space that are MDs, like a bit, um, uh, a Schindler, Bill Schindler, you know, archeologist, Ovedia, heart doctor. So all these people, different backgrounds or whatever, but we're all kind of getting to the same message. And I want to talk about, you know, starting out like with you and your success story with carnivore, can you share with the listeners a bit of your background on why you adopted a carnivore diet and some of the benefits you experienced? Yeah. So I, I spent my twenties collegiate athletics, bodybuilding, working at a gym, like 
I was in shape my entire twenties. Uh, there was, even when I would do the dirtiest of dirty bulks, like there was never a time in my twenty where I didn't have visible abs. Like that, that was just, just what my life was. And then you know, standard dad bod, right? Added some weight, decided I wanted to get rid of it, uh, and realized my old tricks, they worked, but I didn't feel better, right? And that's another. That's something that people use to attack the carnivore diet. Is now you just got rid of the crap in your in your diet. Well, of course, if you get rid of processed food, you're going to feel better. You're going to have this. You're if you lose weight, you're going to have this benefit. Like I was strict. I was whole. I did whole thirty. For anybody who doesn't know what whole thirty is, it's literally like single ingredient whole foods, right? And that's all you eat. You prioritize vegetables, lean meats, your standard, you know, Mediterranean eat good diet. With zero variances. And when I mean zero variances, I mean no snacks off the kids' plates, no, like literally nothing. Um, I spent a lot of my 20s bodybuilding prep. Like I know what it means to not vary off of a diet. And so after 90 days, I didn't feel better. Like I lost weight, I lost like 15 pounds. I was like, man, I don't feel better. Like I feel like my bloating's actually worse. My energy is not better. I'm still tired at two o'clock in the afternoon. And honestly, I was upset. I was like, man, this is BS. Like I just spent 90 days forcing myself to eat 99 ground beef or not 99 ground beef, uh, 99 ground turkey, you know, plain rice, chicken breast, vegetables. Like, like this is stupid. So I gained all the weight right back immediately. And finally it was like, all right, I gotta, I gotta figure something out. And my wife had sent me Paul Saladino with the, she's like, hey, just the caveat. He's a little kooky, but just check him out. I was like, I can get behind that. And I did dirty animal based. Like when I mean dirty, if I wanted to drink at the end of the night, I'd have a drink. If I wanted chips, I'd have chips. But my meals were animal based. And I got such good results that I was like, man, like maybe I should like tighten this up a little bit. And so for about another nine months, I did a fairly strict animal based. And then I was at such, I was at a point where I was such low carb. I was like, man, I don't need to, like, I feel really good, but I wonder what happens if I do, like, what happens if I just get rid of the rest of the fruit? Cause all my carbs were fruit and honey. Um, I was like, what happens if I just get rid of the rest and my ability to become fat, ad fat adapted was so life-changing and people don't really understand this. Anybody who's been an athlete, I'm sure you can relate. Anybody who's done sports, bodybuilding, worked out consistently, knows that they have an expiring window when it comes to the food that they eat, right? So as soon as I eat, I have X amount of time to go get my physical activity in, or there's going to come a point in my physical activity where I start to feel like low blood sugar, like, like I have to eat again. And that's a horrible feeling, right? It's a horrible feeling to be out doing whatever it is you're doing and go, oh no, I need to eat. Um, that's where you buy like the protein bars at the gym, those shakes that you're like, I just got to get something. And that, that's been my entire life, right? Like eating in the middle of double headers, eating in the middle of games, eating as I'm walking to the workout floor. And that's, that was just normal, right? That's, I've never met a person who that wasn't normal for, who's very athletic and active. And the moment I became fat adapted, I literally like, I was like, what? Like it's one o'clock in the afternoon and I haven't eaten yet today. And it's not because I'm not hungry per se. I could eat. I could have eaten three hours ago, but I had an appointment I had to go to. And then I had to come home and then I had to do my own podcast. And then I had 20 minutes and then I got your podcast. And it's like, no, nah, the timing's just not right. I don't want to be rushed. I don't want to like fly through something. So I'm going to eat at the end of this and I'm totally fine. Like I don't have any issues. I could go work out right now. It wouldn't be the best, but I could. So that was such a game changer to me that I was like, I don't want to go back. And so I will from time to time, very infrequently have some fruit or something but as a general rule, I'm I'm carnivore pretty strictly, um, and it's it's honestly just because it makes my life better. So you kind of got on Paul Saladino when he made the switch, 
if I'm hearing you right. And then like you did the switch on Paul Saladino, it sounds like where uh, you're going animal based uh, and then you, you go into strict carnivore and, and you're right. There's this, the landscape of our food over the past few hundred years, right. Has changed so much that things are so abundant and so accessible, highly processed, highly palatable food. And, but all that, with this extra piece of you have to eat. And we're talking, I'm going to do the realm of sports. Some of your examples, I was in the same, same boat. I'm eating before my workouts at the gym. And it's like, be, whether I'm hungry or not, I'm because I'm like, Oh, I don't want to run out of energy. I'm a, I want my workouts to be productive and great. And I want to build muscle. I used to work at a gym and, uh, I don't know if you guys have them out there. Do you have the exports? Where where are you based out of, by the way? Arizona. Do you guys have exports out there? You know what those are? It sounds kind of familiar. I'm originally from the Northwest. So we're like LA Fitness and 24 Hour Fitness or the Gold's Gym like came back a little bit towards the end. They're pretty much like that. And I I had like a gig there where I was like behind the desk and helping people, whatever. And we had to take this course and like we were – we got paid upon how much supplements that we sold. And we we would, every single trainer had the same thing. Like after your workout, you need this many carbs, you need a hundred carbs, you need X amount of protein, you need these bars, this, whatever. So as I was taught this, telling people this is what they need, I would do the exact same thing. And I would feel like I will not get my benefit if I don't have my pre and post workout meal, shakes. Anabolic window. Yeah. Yeah. You only, I mean, if you don't have your pre and post, uh, workout shakes or meals, like you're just going to lose all your gains. And you know, that anabolic window over the past, you know, I would say 10 years, even it's been debunked multiple times. You know, they're seeing that you can eat well, well over 12 hours and still gain some muscle. Yeah. It's, 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 it's one of those things. And so for you, you know, and the one thing you also, cause you did com- competitions, like you, you were, you're pretty intuitive. You know, your body from all the bodybuilding there, the one episode you did with, uh, I'm going to say Ayana Fuentes, you guys were like, literally sounded like two like kids just like laughing about how the transition from your old diets to carnivore and bloating, you both were like, Oh my God, the bloating was terrible. Yeah. It's so it's a, Anybody who's ever done any type of bodybuilding, like will laugh when you say you roll out of bed. The first thing you do is take a progress pic. You pee, right? You go pee because you're going to lose about two pounds. You go take your your progress pics in the mirror because that's the only time you'll be that lean the entire day. And the moment you, it doesn't matter what, I can go sniff coffee, right? Sniff coffee. And I instantly put on, you know, what looks like a pound or two around my, my stomach. And that, that was just reality, right? And so going into a bodybuilding show, you are so stressed out about not being bloated when you get on stage. Like they call it spilling over, you know, a whole bunch of different terms for it, but that's it. You're like, I have to be so careful about what I eat. I have to be careful about how much water I drink because I'm going to go from looking super lean to looking bloated in a matter of seconds. And not like you think that's normal. You know, every time you eat, you're bloated. And the people who say, I don't bloat, you know, you've just never experienced not bloating. Like I have yet to come into like contact with a person who truly understands not bloating until they get rid of all this stuff. And, you know, I, I say I can, you know, take a progress pitch first thing in the morning or at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, I can eat a two pound ribeye and then go take a progress pick. And there's not going to be a whole lot of difference. Sure, you, your weight fluctuates, right? You might, might gain three or four pounds during the day and then you lose it overnight. So you're going to see like tiny, but when I talk about like bloat, like you know what I mean? Like you go you go look in the mirror and you're like, oh no, I got to make sure I don't eat before I go to the like pool or everybody's going to think I'm 15 pounds heavier than I am. And yeah. not, not having that is a, a crazy good feel. There, you know, that's just like, ah. <sighs> I, I used to be vegan for two years, pretty strict on it too. You know, I would say fairly strict really. And like you mentioned earlier, there's that honeymoon phase. You cut the crap out. You're going to feel better, but there's a, 
after the honeymoon phase is over, right? My body wasn't getting what it was needed. I had tons. I mean, I don't even want to look at quinoa anymore, dog. Like so much quinoa, black beans, tortillas, kale. I got to have my green smoothies. And that's another reason why I had to stop. Like I had belfritis in my eyes, my hair. I was getting circle spots in my hair. I didn't feel good, but the bloating, my gut was just so jacked up and I just felt terrible all the time. But once I went to carnivore, I went to keto first and that's like most of the easy transition for peace people, but going to carnivore, no bloating, ne never. And I can go eat a pound, pound and a half shit, two pounds of whatever steak, ground beef, you know, I, I'm not sluggish. I could go do, I could go crush my day. I could go crush a workout if I wanted to. It, it does, it doesn't affect you as much as heavy carb and heavy vegetable diets. Like it's, it is a big thing and you, you don't experience it until you do experience it because you feel, you don't feel bloated, but you don't know what it is to not be bloated. Like you were saying, and that's a big one. And when people are transitioning to either an animal base or a carnivore diet. And I like how you, you mentioned it too. You know, I'll have fruit every once in a while, right? It, it, those things, you're not very dogmatic about it, but the people that are going into this, what are some of the common mistakes they get caught up with when they first are stepping their toe into animal based or carnivore? I think the biggest is the number one that I see is not paying attention to your electrolytes because you're changing your foods um, you unintendedly get a decent amount of electrolytes, no matter the crap that you're eating. Um, a lot of it being added sodium, which I'm not saying is good, but that's at least going to help your electrolyte balances. When you start cutting all that stuff out and most people have to then rewire themselves, especially the salt, right? They're like salt your food. You're like, no, like we don't, we don't salt. There's enough salt and everything else. Everybody tells me I got to minimize my sodium intake. So it's hard for them to then get in the pattern of, well, you need to salt your food, right? So electrolyte imbalances are most often, uh, actually you saw a clip earlier today. Um, I'm going to butcher his last name, Ben Azadi. I think yeah. His name. The 90 day, he's doing that 90 day thing that just came out. Yeah. I actually got to go watch that because he, yeah. he does his gut microbiome on it. Um, but the clip is, and I only watched 10 seconds of it, but it's keto flu, which is what everybody associates to it, is an electrolyte imbalance, plain and simple. Um, so electrolytes is the biggest one. Uh, the three main that the people got to pay attention is your salt intake, uh, magnesium and potassium. And then the other one I see is not eating enough fat. Because again, that also goes hand in hand where people go, yeah, I need to keep my carbs the same. I need to keep my, you know, my protein the same. And I need to lower my fat tick. You're like, Ugh. So then when they transition to a carnivore diet, they're eating all of this protein and not enough fat. And then they now don't have the carb source that they've been having. And now they don't have the fat source. And now they wonder why they don't have energy. So th those are the two biggest. Uh, and then like two point, you know, two and a half would be just not giving a realistic time frame. There are people that feel good day one. Uh, there's people that don't feel good right away. It's going to be an adjustment, right? You're unless you come from keto or animal based or something like that, you're going through a massive adjustment. Just think about other things. If you stop drinking coffee right now, if you you know chewed tobacco for your whole life and then just stopped, if you smoked cigarettes, if you have drank alcohol every night for the last two years and then you just stop, there's going to be an adjustment period. Uh, so people just need to make sure they give themselves enough time to start seeing those benefits. It is, it is adjustment period, you know, cause most of us, I mean, people call this a fad diet, but it's not a fad diet. We've been eating like this for millions of years. Right. And a hard thing for people. And this is one thing that I get a lot is the actual amounts of what you should and or shouldn't be having, uh, do you have people or have success with people tracking or have any guidelines or basic guidelines for somebody of how much uh, protein they should have, how many fats or like grams of fat they should have? So it's tough coaching, especially online because you're not there, 
right? Ideally, people wouldn't track. They would eat when they're hungry. They eat till they're full. But when you first start with somebody, you just don't know, right? So I do have people track. Um, and it's, you know, I explained to them, it's not because we need to track to be successful. You need to track so I know what we're dealing with. Uh, because people have, have misconceptions about what they're eating. The, if people are, you know, if somebody just asks for a general guideline, I tell people to start from a macro standpoint with 70% of your calories from fat, 30% from protein. That's easily conceptually because that's a one, that's about a one-to-one -one gram ratio. So I'm like, if you get one gram of fat for every gram of protein that you eat, you're on a good start, right? Now you can adjust up. Some people might need to adjust up. Um, there's a lot of women, especially that need to go a little higher. Some guys could be totally fine going down, uh, but that's an easy, like conceptually, it's easy to look at a nutrition label and go, oh, this 80, 20 ground beef has about as much, you know, a little bit more fat than it does protein. That's a good place. So that's where I start most people if I don't have any you know background information on them uh it just that is hard for people to to look at right they're like you want me to eat how much fat I'm like look you have to understand like protein should almost always stay stable right no matter what diet you're doing whether you're doing a low carb high fat or a low fat high carb protein is almost always a constant and it's the other two that are manipulated so if I'm going to remove my carbs completely, I've got to replace it with fats. And it, it getting people to understand that. And then some people, it's just hard, right? It's hard for them to eat that much fat because it's way more fat than they've ever eaten in their entire life. And like I said, it's an adjustment period. I've, and this is a part of carnivore and I have conversations with people and it's just some, so happily coming on like the past couple podcasts I did. We talked about like carnivore works until it doesn't. And then you have to pivot and you're going to have to change some things. Some people, you you know, it's really not about aesthetics, right? If we're talking in like aesthetics, yeah, tracking is great, all that stuff. But some people just like, you, we got to work on healing an autoimmune issue. And we're, let's not look at the scale right now. Like we're going to have to take care of that, get a little strict and, and slowly introduce foods back in and see what you can and can't tolerate and kind of move some things around. You know, this aspect of you can eat as much fat as you want and not get fat. Uh, I'm kind of case in point. I've had to change my fat consumption. You know, I was intuitive. I started tracking a little bit more. Um, I was doing a little bit of one-to-one -one and then I, I had to like take it back because I slowly started to gain weight. My activity level was staying the same everything. Um, I'm not doing as many endurance endeavors, but you know, I'm supplementing with like lifting a lot and I'm still doing some cardio and still running good distances and just slowly creeping up. And, but I've dialed back the fat a little bit and it's like turning a switch. You can kind of manipulate a little bit and it's fairly, it's wild how easy it is to just, just tweak a little bit and then your body just adjusts and I, and I feel great still. It's not like I'm taking all this, like cutting a whole entire thing of fat out and just saying, I'm going low fat. No, I'm just tweaking it a little bit and I still feel good and I feel satiated. And that's a big piece too. And I, I don't know if you can agree with this, but having people that are quote unquote on this diet, they'll say it's a diet, but when they hear diet, they think of like suffering. I have to suffer. They don't know what it is to feel full on a diet. So being satiated for my clients, I feel like is a huge plus. Yeah, the the satiation thing, and people will reference like satiety scores, which is absolute complete. I don't even know what um, the satiety score is. Oh gosh. <laughs> uh so it it's based in a whole bunch of metrics that are like a proprietary algorithm that produces satiety score. And you're like, okay, uh potatoes are like number one. Like they're, you've probably heard they're the most satiating food out there. The problem with satiety is satiety is hard to measure, right? Because you can measure it with, you know, like satiety hormones, um, like leptin, but it's, it's still not something that you, you don't measure your levels and you go, that's satiety. It's a very individualized thing. Potatoes ain't it. Um, true satiety is when you look at your food. Right? You take your favorite food in the world and you eat it 
and you have two bites left and you go, nah, I'm good. I'm done. I don't want to eat that. You take anybody's favorite food, their cake, their French fries, their potatoes, you eat raw potatoes. I don't care what it is. Pick your favorite food and you tell somebody just to stop eating. They're like, no, I'm going to finish it. That still tastes good to me. No, I can take a ribeye. I can take the most, the fanciest compound cowboy butter that I've ever made. Just absolute perfection. And if I get to the last two bites and I don't want to eat it, I'm not going to. Like that, that is true satiety. And again, that's another one that people don't know what it actually is. They just think, oh yeah, you know, I was able to go four hours without eating. Like, no, it's, that's the true, like I can listen to my body is I'm hungry. So I eat and then my body says, we're done. And then you go, okay, cool. I'm going to stop. Yeah. That's, I mean, having this regulation naturally, right? I, I can eat a whole pizza without blinking an eye. I can eat a whole large pizza. Like it's not even a question if I finish it or not. And I can keep eating it and keep eating it. Even though if I kind of feel stuffed, I still want it. Uh, but you're right. Ribeye. If I have, if I get a big old cowboy, I mean, it's great. I love it. It's my favorite food, but there's a point where you're just like, I am comfortably stuffed and I don't even think I can finish this. You know, it's going to go in the fridge and then maybe later in the day I'll have it, but, um, feeling full, but and not feeling guilty about it for me, uh, for somebody who's wrestled, I've wrestled, I've had a cut weight a lot of my life. Um, you know, I've done every stupid diet in the world, a juice cleanse diet detox, um, and feeling hungry to me was, uh, a sign that this working, it's good. I'm hungry. So, but now where I'm full a lot, I eat, I eat intuitively. Mostly I track a little bit now because I did notice I was gaining a little bit of weight, but I just feel satiated and I feel so like this freedom. It's really, it's kind of liberating to be honest. It, it really is. And I noticed it and I illustrated it when I was doing my, my diet experiments. So I was eating 4,000 calories of carnivore for three weeks. And it was at one point I was like, man, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to finish this. Cause I cannot physically force myself to eat this much food. Like, and people will go 4,000 calories. It's not that much. I'm like, no, it doesn't seem like that much, but I had to like start cutting out like eggs because they were too satiating. I was like, I just can't do this. And I was able to make it through it. But the whole time is like, I don't want to eat this much food again. I do not want to force myself to eat it because I'm not having a good time, right? Like this is my favorite food. I eat this every day. I do not want to eat anymore. And then when I did 4,000 calories of like a standard American diet, there was one day at four o'clock in the afternoon. I was like, I'll track this food after I eat. I blew through my calories by a thousand calories at four o'clock in the afternoon. Wow. I was like, Ugh. I was like, <laughs> I just hit 5,000 calories and I could straight up eat some more. Like I could eat 10,000 calories, maybe not every day, but I could sit down and eat 10,000 calories. 10,000 calories in carnivore, not a chance. Like there's no shot. And so, that's the, you know, we talked about feeling actually full. That's full, right? It's not, oh man, I don't think I can stuff anymore. I got to like unbutton my pants and, you know, lay on the couch. And then somebody goes, who wants dessert? That's me. No, like there's nothing. There's no scenario where more wants to go in. And that's, you know, it'd be great if everybody could eat that way, right? Granted, everybody comes from a different place. Everybody is not necessarily metabolically healthy. So some people do get into problems with carnivore because they try to eat that way, not understanding like you alluded to, we have some other stuff that we have to undo. Like you haven't been eating this way for your entire life. And now you're just trying to flip a switch and eat whatever you want and eat sticks of butter and uh, like slow down a little bit. We got to do something to undo the damage that's been done before we can get you to a place where you can just eat when you're hungry and eat till you're full. And you mentioned this, I mean, that, that, that whole, you're like, I blew through 4,000 calories of just whatever junk that you had. It's, it's wild to me that we have, like, I have clients that they're doing keto, they'll do keto or they'll do animal based or whatever, but they'll be like somebody that's doing keto would do like, uh, like 
almonds. Well, I just had some almonds, whatever. Like, okay, how many almonds did you actually have? They don't really understand how many. And again, the whole calorie in calorie out argument, whatever. It's not like calories don't matter. However, if you're having handful after handful of almonds, thinking it's like a healthy thing, healthy snack, you, you can easily have a thousand calories of almonds without even thinking about it. Uh, nut butters, um, these keto bars or whatever. So the people that think like tracking is good, tracking is managing, but if you think you're having a healthy snack, uh, or having something a little bit after dinner every night that it all adds up, it all adds up. Yeah. And I rag on calories and calories out a lot. Um, and everybody assumes, I just think that calories don't matter and that thermodynamics don't apply. And really it's calories do matter to an extent. Um, it's just, I'm just trying to get away from this notion that a thousand calories of, I, I won't say a thousand because people will use the Twinkie diet. So I, I like 4,000 because I did 4,000, right? 4,000 calories of Twinkies is not going to elicit the same physiological response as 4,000 calories of steak. Like it's, it's just not. Yeah. And, you know, people love to use the extreme examples. Well, you eat a thousand calories. Yeah, sure. Eat a thousand calories of anything. You'll lose weight. Like you are literally starving yourself. Eat 10,000 calories of anything and you'll gain weight until you go, well, you know, there's hormonal implications of like type one diabetics and people with, uh, I forget the name off, off the top of my head, but there's a disorder where you can't store fat and you need 10,000 calories and you're not going to get fat because you have a physiological disorder. And so people assume, I think calories don't matter. Well, they do, but just don't fixate on it because you can't get accurate with your calories. You can't accurately predict what your calories out. You can't calories in are just be conscious of the amount of food that you're eating and the types of food and that you might have to manipulate or you might have to say, no, you might have to not eat the thousand calories of almonds. You might have to not eat, you know, 18 tablespoons of butter every day. There may be stuff that you need to adjust, but just because, you know, I say things like calories in calories out is stupid and it, you know, it doesn't work for the majority of people. doesn't mean you just have free reign to eat whatever you want. Yeah. The, uh, I had, um, my friend Adrian Gladhill was on the podcast, uh, and she was on the biggest loser and they were restricting people's calories. I think they said the females were up to 900 calories a day, which is crazy. And the guys were 1200 calories a day while they're working out twice a day, amongst other things, stressing out about food all day, every day. And yeah, they lost weight, right? On the scale. However, they did the biggest loser study and they followed, I think anywhere from six to 12 people. And this is like six years after the fact that their basal metabolic rate is still in the tank. Like they, their, their metabolism and their body has been fried six years after the fact by restricting too much, right? It's okay to eat. And then people that didn't restrict um, on their diets actually have a higher basal metabolic rate than if they did. That's like, okay, so we need to understand like this shouldn't be a uh, who can have the least amount of calories every single day. It, this should be something that it's enjoyable that you can live off of. It's a lifestyle and it shouldn't be like if you're white knuckling it, every single day. And I get that. Like you're a, we're a bodybuilder. That's a sport. You're making certain sacrifices for your sport, just like any other athlete would, but just the average Joe Schmo looking to lose a little bit of weight. If you're white knuckling it every day, you ain't going to make it. You ain't going to stick with it. It It's a hundred percent true. And yeah, I'm somebody that can look at food and tell you pretty accurately what macros are with it, but I don't anymore. I, you know, I, I weighed my food for total of six weeks um just to present it but i'm i am consistently and i and i fluctuate right i fluctuate my weight depending on how strict i've been or you know i went camping and had some beers and ate you know the food that was there and you know i gained eight pounds right and then came back and lost it all because you know when you don't have carbs and then you eat a whole bunch of carbs you're gonna gain some water but i uh <laughs> 
people love this one. So people love to, I'll do a video and they go, you don't look like your profile pic, bro. Like you don't look like that. I'm like, well, here's my profile picture was taken at the end of December. And I am currently within a pound or two of my weight in December consistently. Right. And then I'll post a picture and they'll be like, oh, well, that's, uh, er," and I'm like, no, dude, I, I look the same. Like I literally looked, looked the same the entire year and I don't have to track. I don't have to count. Now, part of that is my experience, right? I know that if I just go and force feed myself into eat after a long enough time, yes, I will probably start gaining some weight. I also know that if I restrict myself enough, I will lose weight, but I don't want to do either right now. So I literally eat when I'm hungry. Like I said, it's two o'clock in the afternoon and old me would have never stood for going five to six hours past my normal eating window. It's fine. If I only eat once today, it's not a big deal. If I get hungry at seven o'clock and I want to eat again, I'll eat again. If I you know, decide I'm going to go till tomorrow morning and I don't normally eat in the morning, but I'm going to eat in the morning, I'm going to eat in the morning. It's not a big deal. The goal is to get to a point where it doesn't, yeah, like you said, you don't white knuckle it. I don't care, right? If I hop on the scale and I realize I'm like three pounds over what I'm normally am, I'm like, huh. All right, just make sure I'm a little stricter, right? And then it goes back down. And I like I can just do that with just the simplest changes, not this, oh, shoot, I got to get my MyFitnessPal back out, right? I got to scan all my food. I got food scale back out. Oh, I don't do any of that. Like, and I can maintain almost to the T the same way. And in conjunction with that, even though you have these ups and downs of some weight gain, weight loss, whatever, how do you feel though? I feel the exact same. And that's the best part. Like yeah. I look in the mirror every day and I'm like, we're good. I feel good. I sleep good. And it's like, there's nothing, you know, if I, you know, so the, the sad experiment after a couple of days, I'm like, I don't like this very much. Right. I don't like the way I look when I get up. I don't like how I feel. And that's a better indicator of what I'm eating because I can't, I can get away with cheating, right? I can eat, you know, whatever the heck I want at the end of the night, have a drink and wake up feeling fine. Um, sometimes I've pushed it. I'm like, how many days of doing this before I start to, it starts to get negative. Right. And then after like three nights in a row, it, part of it is I don't eat bad during the day. Like during the day is the easiest thing. But at the end of the night, when you sit down and you're like, man, I kind of want like to snack on something. Like how many, how many nights in a row before I start to, you know, see some negative effects. And, you know, it's like three or four. And that's not what people want to hear. Cause some people will be like, oh my gosh, I sniffed a bag of Doritos and I gained weight and I felt terrible and my skin broke out. But there is a point where that starts to affect you. And then I'm like, no, let's dial it back. <laughs> like, I don't want to get out of this. So I'm just going to dial it back, go back, and then just smooth sail from there. Yeah. And just like anything else, things, you know, are ever changing. Uh, I look at, you know, I don't look at it as, as cheat meals. And I think you've talked about this as well as like allowing yourself to have those things very few and far between. I tell people all the time, like if I'm in Italy, right. And they, they're like, I'm with family. They want to go have pasta or they want to have pizza. Like, dude, I'm going to have that. I'm not going to be like, Oh no, I'm a carnivore. So I don't want them to take my card away. Like, no, I'm going to have those things. I'll have red wine. Um, and in, and enjoy the life's about enjoyment, but knowing that you will, cause like 95% of my diet is red meat, water, salt and freaking coffee. Like that's it. And allowing myself to have those things and those enjoyments and sprinkle it in my life. Like that's what life is about. It's finding your balance. Do you agree about like, I don't know if you agree or disagree about, I, I don't really like to call them cheat days. Cause then you have this conception about like I cheated today versus I just lived today. I don't know if that makes sense to you. No, it, it yeah. I, I completely agree. And so I am, I try to be like the least dogmatic carnivore out there. And I'm like, and people go, well, can you eat this? I get that comment all the time. Can I eat this? Can I, you need whatever the heck you want. 
Thank you. <laughs> like, well, but is yeah. it carnivore? I was like, who cares? Yeah. Who cares if it's actually carnivore? Well, but I'm, yeah. Okay. So I, I can give you the blueprint for what carnivore is. And yes, I think it's a great place for people to start. But if you are worried about eating something and whether that qualifies as carnivore, like we, we have the wrong conception of what we're trying to do here. I eat the way that I do because I feel the best doing this. I don't feel like taking the mental energy and the time to see how far I can push it while still feeling the same way. I don't have any reason to. You know, why do you eat a little bit of fruit? I'm like, why? I, I don't feel better eating fruit. I like fruit, but there's nothing that fruit does for me that makes me go, I want to see just how much fruit I can get. Right? Because it's probably not going to be a very a whole lot. So what am I doing by having a handful of blueberries? If I really want a handful of blueberries and we have fresh blueberries, sure, maybe I'll eat some. But I don't include it in my diet because it doesn't help me feel the best that I feel. And so to your point, if I'm going to go out, if we're going to go on a date, I'm not, I'm not the person that asks them to cook my stuff special. Right? If there's a pasta dish, we're in an Italian restaurant and there's a pasta dish that looks really good, I'm going to eat the pasta dish. Right? I'm probably going to bloat. I'm probably not going to feel that great. I'm probably going to get to the end of the night and be like, mm, I don't know if that was worth it. Right. But that's, you know, like you said, it's, yeah, live, but don't be so dogmatic with your diet that you're like, I cannot. You shouldn't eat something because you don't like the way you react to it. And I like the way I feel best eating the way that I do. And I like to keep it simple. And I don't see any need to change it because I don't, there's no better right now right I've, I've done all the diets like like you i've done them all this is the best that i felt and there's no food out there that i want so bad that i'm willing to try to incorporate because it's not going to make me feel better so i eat this way if i'm going to have some leniencies i will have it but in the back of my head i know it's not doing me any good if i consistently have these leniencies it's going to have a start having a negative effect not to the fact and people will hear this, right? They'll go, oh my gosh, you must not be healthy if you know, you're going to have all of these problems. No, that's not what I'm saying. When I mean negative effect, it means I am no longer here. Even if I come down to here, why? Why would I want to? I want to be here all the time, right? Like, So I'm going to eat the way that keeps me here. And if I have too many indulgences, I'm going to start coming down a little bit, whether it's a little bit of brain fog or I don't sleep as good or I bloat a little bit. If I don't have to feel that way, I'm not going to. Yeah. We, the balance, finding your own balance and how you, how you look. We're all a little vain. We all want to look good. Not going to lie. Uh, that's a piece of it, but really how do you feel is what should really dictate what you're doing. And, and I, this next piece I want to talk about, and I think we kind of have the similarities, but I want to hear your in, uh, take on it is, you know, building muscle, like the importance of building muscle, like the diet is a one piece of it, but getting strong, right. And, and putting a premium on building muscle. Um, what's your thoughts on that? This is not my thought. Um, I forget who said it. I, I know a bunch of people have said it, uh, but this is my contention that muscle mass is the greatest predictor of longevity, hands down. Uh, I don't think it matters what diet you eat if you can build muscle. Now, somebody's going to say, oh, well, look at bodybuilders. Eh, we're a little bit, it's a little bit different here. Um, you know, when you are doing that type of stuff to an extreme, but for the average person, if there was one thing that they could do in order to improve their longevity, improve their lives, it'd be add muscle. Like you, you just got to And to the people who are like, well, we didn't have gyms back in the day. Everybody had physical jobs, right? Like nobody sat at a desk. We didn't have computers, you know, and it, this is going to sound like somebody's going to have a problem with it, but whatever. Yes, then, let's do the, it. <laughs> the men went out and did physical labor jobs. Yeah. Like every guy had a physical labor job and every guy was relatively in shape because that's the way the body works. It's called Wolf's Law, right? Your body adapts to the demands that are placed upon it. And if you go out and work in a steel mill, if you go out and work on an oil rig, you're going to build muscle just because your body has to. And 
So I think it, yeah, it's absolutely paramount, which then leads into, oh, you can't build muscle on carnivore. Why not? Well, carbs. Okay. What do carbs do? Help you have good workouts. Okay. Well, what if I can get my energy from, I don't know, fats? Like, oh, no, 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 glycogen. Okay. I have plenty of glycogen. I have no problem getting a pump. I have no problem with vascularity. Sure. If I, you know, carb load a thousand grams of carb the night before, my pump and my vascularity would be a little bit better. But is that really worth it? Like, I don't need it. I have yet to hit a workout where my muscles just stop working. So what exactly am I eating carbs for? Well, they're, they're protein sparing. Cool. Fats are protein sparing too. Eat enough protein and you will have no problem. Like that's a legit study. That is a study that says, by the way, we look at it. It actually looks like fats are extremely protein sparing. And as long as you eat enough protein, you won't have any issues with muscle protein breakdown. Okay. So now what? Uh, people will say carbs are anabolic, which they absolutely are not. <laughs> like there's nothing anabolic about a carbohydrate. So you, you start going through all these things and and people just it's years and years of these these sports backgrounds and these bodybuilding and gotta eat carbs and you gotta and I honestly think it's stemmed in the the idea that it's really hard to gain weight without a bunch of carbs. And if people are not gaining massive amounts of weight on their bulk, they don't feel like they're doing anything. And so I, I had a conversation with somebody. I'm like, okay. He's like, what do we do when we bulk? I go, well, first of all, you stop with this idea that you need to put on a bunch of mass, right? Guess what? It's more beneficial if you bulk for six months and you put on four pounds, but it's muscle, as opposed to bulking for six months and you put on 30 pounds and you have no idea how much muscle it is. Because you now have to spend the next three months cutting to see if you made any progress. Yeah, these pictures that you see too of people, like I, to me, again, bodybuilding is a sport. I've never done it, but I just see like the before and afters of, oh, I'm bulking. And I, maybe you can speak a little bit more to it, but it's like I'm bulking. So yet I have free reign to eat whatever I want because this is my goal right now because I need the carbs. I need the fat. I need whatever. You got people like drinking freaking like ice cream stuff. Like it's crazy. And, but I don't even think those swings of like, they get heavy and you're right. I, how much of it is it really muscle? Cause I've seen these pictures. I'm like, wow, you look bloated and thick. Like, like I'm not too sure how much muscle there is. Um, I don't know if people do it and you can, you, you're in the world more than I of just like, I have free reign cause I'm bulking and then they get to the cut and, and it's just drastic shift down. I've achieved my goal. I'm going to do it all over again. Is that like kind of the cycle that it just keeps happening? Yeah. I mean, that's basically it. And the, the free reign with bulking is most people don't intend to do a dirty bulk. Like that, that would be considered a dirty bulk. Like you just eat whatever. But you have this psychological hurdle to overcome when you are doing a quote unquote clean bulk because you have to force feed yourself food. And then you wrestle with this, man, I don't know if I can get my calories in. It would be better to eat this crap and get my calories than not eat this crap and not get my calories. And then you go off into the spiral because it is so much easier to eat crap and hit your calories than it is to sit and eat 18 meals of chicken and rice. It's just, it's so hard. And so you end up with the cycle and you gain a bunch of fat and then you go down and you get down and you're like, oh yeah, I'm def I definitely gained some muscle. You're like, are you sure? Like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Okay, are you like, right? I did that so many times. And then you're like, man, I don't know. And then you start feeling, you start cutting and you're like, man, I feel little. My strength's going down because I'm cutting so aggressively now and just being heavier lends itself to being stronger. And so then you just like go through the cycle and you're like, man, I don't want to cut anymore. I want to be big again. Cause when you cut, you don't look good in a t-shirt, right? Like you don't fill out a t-shirt the same way. And 99% of people see you with a t-shirt on. So you're like, man, I got a bulk, but then you get up and you're like, man, I don't want to go to the pool. Cause now like I'm feeling fat. Ah, oh, shoot. I need to cut again. Right. And so you just, it's just this total mind, you know what? And 
it's just unhealthy. Like you put yourself through these 20 and 30 pound roller coaster swings, you know, gorging yourself to try and gain weight. And it's just bulking on carnivore, just eat enough, eat enough, eat enough protein, work out hard. You'll build muscle and you'll have these four to five pound swings. Yeah. But you look at, okay, let's look at Anthony Chafee, the dog and Sean Baker, right? Two MDs, they eat in the States lifting weights. Sean's trying to dunk nowadays. Like you can get strong on carnivore and build muscle, right? This whole thing of, uh, you know, I have to have uh, so many carbs to do my activity. You know, I did a full Ironman. I did a full Ironman while I was carnivore. I wouldn't even say I had 50 carbs for a 15 hour endeavor. And I felt great. Didn't run out of energy. But you got other people slamming gel blocks and uh, eating thousands of calories and th- th- I would say thousands of grams of carbs just to make it through. There, I think people uh, you mentioned it earlier too, like give it the time of the adaption because it's going to take a while. And depending on if you're you know if you're going standard American diet to a carnivore, just like a cold turkey style, it, it's going to take you a little bit. People that do keto and kind of and then animal base and going to carnivore kind of how like you went, it's a little bit easier. And yeah, that's just the ups and downs. I can't, I can't stand it. That's just so much. That's a lot for people. And you want to do this sport, wrestling, bodybuilding, MMA fighters, all these sports that have like weight attached to it is, is, is hard. Um, and then I wanted to talk about a couple of these things too, while we're just talking about a little bit of fitness and importance of muscle, uh, savage carnivore fitness, and you also a carnivore experiment coming up. What, what are these things going? Uh, so savage carnivore fitness is just the coaching program that I run. Mm-hmm. Um, I will start offering a, like a community based. Um, I think that's super beneficial for a lot of people in carnivore just cause they, they lack the community aspect. Uh, cause if you don't have a large social media following, you don't realize that there's a lot of carnivores out there. Um, the experiment will i am going to do a reverse diet so for people that know what reverse diet is it's the opposite of standard dieting you just gradually increase your calories up with the goal of getting them as high as possible without gaining too much weight um it's really popularized with women especially when they do bodybuilding shows um, so as not to jack their hormones up oftentimes you'll find them they cut down super low do their bodybuilding show slam themselves with food and then absolutely wreck all their hormones. So the reverse diet is to slowly get back to maintenance. You can also use it as a way to essentially maximize out your metabolism by slowly going up. You let your body adapt, you push your calories as much as you possibly can without gaining a ton of weight. And then you essentially slam them back down and watch your body just like get rid of, of fat and weight like crazy. So I'm doing it for two reasons. One to illustrate reverse dieting. Um, and two, I want to give myself time. I can call it a bulk, right? Cause I'll be eating excess calories, but I also want to see at what point will I start gaining weight? Cause when I did 4,000 calories of carnivore, I lost weight. Um, and I straight up lost fat, like wow, over three weeks. And even if you factor in my standard American, I had eight weeks of eating roughly 4,000 calories and I ended up like six pounds lighter. I didn't have a whole lot of fat to lose. So my goal is to see how many calories and how long I can go um, with eating that way before I start gaining weight. Uh, part of it is my own personal. I'm, I'm intrigued. I know at some point I have to, I think. But I also know that in my experience, if I eat super clean, it's really difficult for me to eat or for me to gain weight. So I'm, I want to see. Um, the other is I now have a lot more data. Um, like I just partnership with, I've done a couple of videos on it, but I partnership with a, uh, a company that does a body composition analyzer that actually seems fairly accurate. Uh, it has me at like 11.2% body fat right now. Uh, it's similar to like an in-body but I have it in my house, right? Like it's just a scale with a handle on it. In bodies are like 30 grand. Uh, and it's comparable to a DEXA, which people wanted me to get DEXA scans. And I'm like, cool, bro. 
It's an hour each way. I've got to schedule them, you know, months in advance and it's 150 bucks each. Like I'm not dropping $300 so I can prove to you guys that I didn't lose just a bunch of water weight. And Texas, like they're like gold standard, but they're, they have their faults as well. You know, they can, they can get water weight wrong depending on how lean you are. So I was like, cool. Now I at least have something to give people. Uh, I upgraded like my watch to do an activity tracker. I'll add that. Um, I got a blood test company that I'm going to work with. So just a whole bunch of different stuff just to show people, hey, this is what, this is how much your body can adapt when you have metabolic flexibility, when you are metabolically healthy. Now you take somebody who's metabolically sick, you know, they're obese already, they're overweight, they've had chronic problems and you slam them into this. Yeah, we're going to have different outcomes. But my whole goal with the carnivores experiment to begin with was, hey, calories are not the, like, the end all be all. I'll show you guys all my BMR stuff. My BMR is like 2000. I am not very active right now. I am 3000 steps, right? Like I, if I hit 10,000 steps, I went and did something Mm -hmm. like I, I'm at home most of the time. I don't get that many steps. My workouts are an hour of weightlifting. So for people to say, I must've been in a deficit at 4,000 calories, it's not even close. Right. Because all of your traditional metrics, if you measure how many calories I should have burned, it's not even, it's not even close to 3,000, much less 4,000. So I'm intrigued to see where I can get um, part of my hypothesis. And what I brought last time is I have very low levels of insulin, which people will go, oh my gosh, you, that's, you know, you're going to be diabetic or not perfect blood glucose. If you have low insulin and you have perfect blood glucose, it's not a problem. It's when you have low insulin and high glucose that that's a problem. So just, it, it's fun for me. It gives me something to do. Um, otherwise, I kind of go through this roller coaster a little bit of, yeah, I don't really need to stay strict because I don't need to. Um, so having an experiment, having you know some kind of accountability, knowing that I have to post what I ate every day, uh, it makes it fun. It gives me something to to strive for. People listening to this would be like, we got different definitions of fun. <laughs> That's it, it. It's I mean, true. Like it's it's hard for me to stay on task when I'm just like maintaining, right? Because in the back of my mind, I know I can go binge for a week and then go back on track for a week and not be any worse for wear. But in the back of my mind, I also know that's that's not good. Like I'm gonna have some issue that pops up. I'm not going to feel good. I'm not going to sleep as good. So why? But then in the, you know, when that time comes to whether I'm going to eat it or not eat it, I go, why wouldn't I? I don't have anything like it's not going to affect me. Now for people listening, I 99% of the time I don't like I am very strict on my diet, but knowing that I have something, knowing that I'm working towards gaining, you know, muscle, knowing that I'm cutting, knowing that I'm doing an experiment it just makes it that much easier for me. Yeah. And I know, I know we're wrapping up and stuff, but like, that's, it's, that's an important thing you just said, because having a goal in mind and having this specific why, you know, we had former athletes, you know, when you get out of athletics, it's a part of your identity and it's the seat, like just this way, the seasons fall, like, in your in the back of my mind, I was like, okay, like football season's coming around. I got to be doing this. I'm going to be lifting. I'm going to be putting on a little bit of weight. Wrestling season's around the corner. I need to be dropping weight. So I always had this one thing, this one goal to work for. And it's important to have because if you don't have a target, you're just throwing stuff. You know, you're throwing at the board. You're not even looking. But having the goal, whether, you know, you want to see like how many calories you can bring down, bring them up. But that's going to be a good experiment to just see what I'm I'm curious of what is going to happen. Like you might turn around and be like, this was I'm freaking, you know, I'm gaining muscle like crazy. I'm whatever. It's just going to be an interesting thing because you have a number of calories. You have a number of fat. You have this uh, whatever, how much protein. But it that's a mathematical equation that you're putting together. But we have a you're going to have a biological like outcome. And sometimes those don't line up. You know, so it's gonna be it's gonna be cool. You gotta do Which like was, you know you need to do it like a YouTube mini series on it or something. 
Yeah, I, I need to do long form content. Um, what I'll probably do is I'll do, I was posting it every day, right? And that's just tough. The amount filming myself eating was terrible. And I, I know I'm going to have to do it because people will say, well, you didn't eat that cal that many calories. I'm like, cool, you, you watched me put it in my mouth every single day. Um, I'll probably do it like on Instagram stories. So I don't have to do as much editing with it. Cause it just gets time consuming, but I'm, I'm curious, right? I'm, I don't know if I can get to the point in a short amount of time. So I'll probably do like two weeks at each level. I'll go up like 500 calories each level. I don't know if I can get to a point where I will start gaining weight soon enough before I run out of the ability to eat that much. Like I'm already trying to game plan. Like when I get to 4,000 calories, how am I going to go to 4,500? Like what kind of butter type concoction can I come up with to just get pure calories in? Because I can't, I'm not going to be able to eat that much. I already know I'm going to get to 4,500. Oh my gosh, I cannot do this. So I'm like, man, how am I going to, how am I going to work this? I literally have to game plan to get enough calories in. I have to melt butter down and take it Oh in. dude, I, I literally called, it was, and I apologize for any cussing on it. I called the, the JT fuck it shake <laughs> because at towards the experiment, I would get to the end of the night and I would have 800 calories left. And I'm like, I literally cannot eat. So I would take however many calories I needed. I would do a couple scoops of protein, some raw milk just for the calories and then whatever was left over, I'd melt butter and add to it. Oh, it's literally what I was doing. It I'd sounds like, oh, like shoot. Uh, I got a, I got like five tablespoons of butter. I got to put in here, dump yeah, it in there, blend it up and chug it. The guy from uh, always sunny in Philadelphia. Yeah. How, how he had to gain all that weight and he's just like eating all day, every day. Oh God. I mean, it's, it's funny because like coming from a wrestler, that'd be like the dream Like we used to like, I used to like look at the heavyweights. And I'm like, guys, you don't know how good you got it. Like they're, <laughs> they're eating before weigh-ins, right? We're all cutting weight. We're sucked down. We have no water in our body and they're eating like pastrami sandwiches, like whatever. Um, and they could just eat as much. And that's like, oh my God, that'd be the most amazing thing. But this is like the opposite. We're like, you're just, you're going to feel like shit. <laughs> that's a lot. Yeah, it's it's tough. And luckily, if I get it in at the end of the night, I can just go to bed and right. then I feel okay. But I'm not hungry. Like I did a I did a 36 hour fast after my last one because I just didn't want to eat. And I don't fast. Like I'd never gone past like 20 hours. And I just went 36 and I was like, all right, I think I'll eat now. I think I'm okay. <laughs> like that's that's I mean, that's a big piece. Talking about that food freedom. I eat when I'm hungry. If I'm not hungry. I don't eat just because it's breakfast doesn't mean I got to eat, you know, but, uh, JT, man, this is great. Uh, this is awesome. I can't, I can't wait to like watch this whole thing. go down. <laughs> I'm going to be like stalking the Instagram and be like, all right, dude, how much is he going to be eating today? This is going to be super cool. I'll, uh, I'll start it out middle of August. I'll be out of town the first week of August and I probably like I'll be on the road. So I'll eat decent, but you know, I'll probably put on a little weight from, from some indulgences, but probably middle of August, I'll, I'll start hammering it down and, and start getting on it. Cool. And where can people uh, find you and connect with you? Uh, so my website is the inner carnivore.com. Uh, also the name of the podcast and then carnivore JT. Uh, it's an underscore on Twitter, carnivore underscore JT. But luckily there's like no carnivore JTs in the world. So if you Google carnivore JT, I'll pop up. Um, I'm on pretty much every social media platform. Uh, in, I'm active on all of them. Instagram is the one I'm probably the most active on. Awesome. We'll definitely put in the show notes and thanks for everybody listening today for the primal foundations podcast.